We've got Mark Lewison, author of All These Years, Volume 1, Tune In, the extended special edition. And for those to whom that doesn't mean much, Mark Lewison is the Beatles scholar. He's the author of The Beatles Sessions, The Complete Beatles. He's the guy who figured out what day John Lennon met Paul McCartney and proved it. And his research is unmatched in rock music. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just got to thank you for this book. I've read the extended edition four times. It's my comfort <laughs> reading every year. This is a wonderful, wonderful work of scholarship. And I wish we could go through the whole thing, but your time is limited. And I want to focus in on one area. You made a lot of revelations in this book, and you debunked a lot of myths, things like the myth that John Lennon's parents forced him to choose between Freddie and Julia at age five. Not true. And you prove it with eyewitnesses. But there's one area where I think the revelations in this book are the most important and the things I want to get across to our listeners. And that's the story of how the Beatles were signed to Parlophone Records and how their first single, Love Me Do, backed with P.S. I Love You, came to be. So first question, whose decision at Parlophone was it to sign the Beatles? Was it George Martin or someone else? Well, George Martin did sign them, um, but he was kind of instructed to sign them by a man called Len Wood, L.G. Wood, who was managing director of EMI Records. Uh, and that's because there was some pressure being applied um, within and without EMI and, 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 and an affiliated company um, for the Beatles to be signed. Uh, not that anything great was particularly expected of them, but it was just one of those things that actually evolved. A situation evolved, and George was encouraged to sign them. Uh, and he had already heard a tape of theirs and not been impressed by them. And then he ended up signing them. And that is um, what happened in between those two events, him not liking them, but then him signing them, is the pressure. And that pressure was coming from a company called Ardmore and Beechwood, which was a publishing house owned by EMI. And mm -hmm. they wanted, they had heard Like Dreamers Do and Love of the Loved and Hello Little Girl originals, Lennon McCartney originals, and they wanted to publish them. So they were putting pressure on EMI. And George Martin was particularly vulnerable to pressure at this point for two reasons, his recent contract negotiations and some personal peccadilloes. Well, I wouldn't quite call them peccadillos, but I, I know what you're driving at. Um, <laughs> Forgive my puritanicism. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, the story in a nutshell is this. Brian Epstein, when he became the Beatles manager, encouraged them to start performing some of the songs that John and Paul had been writing. They themselves, left to their own devices, were a little embarrassed of their own early songs and didn't play them on stage. And people who went to see the Beatles in Liverpool, in the Cavern and other places didn't even know that they wrote songs. Uh, but Brian, when he found out about it, said that they should do them. And they added three numbers, the ones you've just mentioned, to their set list. And when they went down to London in on New Year's Day 62 to do a test for the Decca record company, they included those three songs, uh, Like Dreamers Do, Love of the Loved and Hello, Hello Little Girl. They ultimately didn't sign a contract with Decca, but Brian had some of those songs pressed up as discs in order to, to kind of shop them around other companies. Uh, and he ended up in the office of music publishing company Ardmore and Beechwood. And Ardmore and Beechwood were interested in publishing them. And Brian said, well, that's very nice. But what I really want for these boys is a recording contract. And at that point, you can have the publishing. So Ardmore and Beechwood were then joining Brian in, in hassling to get the Beatles a contract. And Ardmore and Beechwood was a fully owned company of EMI. And um, it, the, the word ended up in the ear of Lenwood that the Beatles should be signed uh, in order for the EMI to get the publishing on these songs. And he just had gone through a rather tense negotiation with George Martin because George was um, angling to get a royalty on record productions, which was becoming what, well, in fact, I think was by that point commonplace in America, but was not so in the UK. And George really was reluctant to sign again another three-year contract with EMI without getting a royalty. But at this time, he had quite a lot of personal expenses and couldn't afford to leave the company and branch out on his own. And so with reluctance, 
he accepted the new contract without a royalty arrangement, but it had been a bit of a bruising encounter with Lane Wood. Neither man had enjoyed the experience. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing you mentioned was that um, George uh, had been married in the uh, late 1940s to a Scottish woman, had a family, uh, two children, but um, by the late 1950s was in a discreet relationship with his secretary, at Parlophone, and that was um, Judy Lockhart Smith. And um, they kept this incredibly discreet. They were both uh, anxious that it should not get out, but, I mean, it was known to a few people. And in spring 1962, George spoke at a conference in the north of England and took Judy with him. And uh, word did begin to trickle out, and it reached the ears of his boss, Len Wood, who, to whom that kind of behaviour was really improper. Um, and therefore, for and a few other reasons besides, when he had to assign one of the in-house producers to record this act called the Beatles, or the Beatles, as George Martin thought they were called, um, mm -hmm. he chose George Martin, and George signed the Beatles, even though he had already rejected them, to the contract with Parlophone Records. And so then on June 6th, they go down to London for their first session with EMI. And for many years, it's been unclear whether that was an audition or whether it was a recording, a recording session with a contracted artist. And you proved definitively it was a recording session with a contracted artist and that the Beatles were signed before they went in there. Yes. I don't know whether they believed it was a test or not. Uh, I suspect they probably did. No, actually, I really don't know. Like, No, let me think about this. Likelihood is they knew they were under contract because Brian Epstein had already been sent the contract and signed and returned it. Uh, and indeed, I think it had been signed by EMI as well before the date. So, no, they would have known it was a proper session. But... The, the nature of the way they had been signed was such that th certain things were obscured. The whole relationship the Beatles had with EMI, with Parlophone, for about the first five, five months was a little bit strange. And then it got sorted out by the end of the year and everybody went forward knowing where they were. Um, but it, it went down in law as a test. In fact, in my own book, The Beatles Recording Sessions, based on the information I then had, and everybody's testimony, I said it was an audition, but it, it wasn't. It was definitely a session under their first contract. And in a way, it was a test, and it was a test that Pete Best failed. And he had already had struggles with um, their German producer, Bert Kampfert, when they recorded My Bonnie with Tony Sheridan. And he had been one of the worst aspects of their failed DECA audition. And George Martin just said, clearly, after this first session, I will not record with Pete Best in the future, which triggers the firing of Pete Best, which we're not going to get into here. But one of the things I like about your book is it makes the case clearly and, and not Per, you know, not, not maliciously, but it just it reinforces with multiple quotes from people at the time who knew at the time that Pete Best was just not up to snuff. He might have been oh, he was marginally okay for live performances, but he really could only play one or two rhythms, and he just could not cut it as a recording drummer. Yeah. So they bring they 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 do the audition. They record four tracks there, none of which are declared suitable for use. They're brought back after having been sent an acetate of a demo of a song called How Do You Do It, which I think that EMI was mislabeling as How Do You Do, written by a guy whose pseudonym was Mitch Murray. And this was a pop piffle song that they did not want to record, but they <laughs> did do an arrangement and take it in there. And it's long been thought that George Martin listened to their pleas to release Love Me Do rather than How Do You Do It, but that's not quite who made the decision. No, no. Um they, as we know, the Beatles, as, and as you said, they did record it. They actually did some work on it. They they rearranged it to an extent, and they did a pretty good job on it. it you called it pop piffle, and certainly it was the kind of light white song that they didn't like to do. Um, but they did do a job on it, and it could have come out. Um, John Lennon went up to see George Martin because someone had to go forward from the Beatles and beg him not to release this because they really didn't want it out as their first record. Um, and when it didn't come out, 
they assumed that George Martin, being the great guy that he is, had listened to their pleas uh, and, and and bowed to their view that really, you know, OK, we won't put it out then if you don't want it out. But that actually wasn't the case. George Martin was still intent on putting it out, not least because he never liked Love Me Do. Um, and as, as, as was explained to me later, if he didn't like it, why did he put it out? Well, he put it out because he had to put it out because he couldn't put out how do you do it. And that wasn't because they were asking him not to do it. It was because of various other people involved in it, not least Ardmore and Beechwood, <clears throat> who were expecting the publishing of this first record. After all, they caused it to happen, uh, but wouldn't have had the publishing of how do you do it because it was already assigned to Dick James. Um, there was Mitch Murray himself who didn't want it out. Um, when he heard How Do You Do It, he rather thought the Beatles had been taking the mickey out of his song uh, in the way that they had rearranged it. And um, he didn't particularly, well, he, he made it quite clear that it couldn't come out. Um, then there was the notion that How Do You Do It could be the B side of Love Me Do, and both Dick James and How Do You and Mitch Murray said no to that. So George Martin was forced to put out Love Me Do, even though he didn't rate it. And when it came out, he didn't give it any support at all. Um, but then, to his great surprise, it became a hit. And that turned his head. And after Love Me Do, the Beatles' relationship with George Martin was transparent and mutually supportive. But with Love Me Do, it wasn't. <clears throat> um, it was interesting to, to really look at George Martin's work before the Beatles came along, because what I discovered was when he worked with interesting artists um, doing something original, then he could bring his own originality to the table uh, and greatly enhance whatever work was, was going on. He really was... Uh, a rebel within record production at that time and um, asked or uh, in with the opportunity to make the unusual he did it brilliantly you've just played right said fred that was the follow-up to uh in my opinion an even better record called, called the hole in the ground also by bernard cribbins um sun arise by rolf harris is another one the records that peter sellers and spike milligan made were were truly original and all those are superb productions by george martin but when he was faced with an ordinary record by an ordinary artist he made ordinary productions so he thrived with originality uh, and was somewhat suffocated by by banality and the beatles of course uh, were nothing if not original in everything that they did uh, and that was why they had the perfect working relationship and his early struggles in identifying love me do which was a hit which was borne out by the facts that it became a hit are typical of his struggles. You know, this is the guy who passed on the chance to sign Tommy Steele and sign his backup band, The Vipers, instead. And and yeah. repeatedly, uh, every time he went for a pop hit, he whiffed. And his pop instincts were, as usual, bad in this early instance with Love Me Do. But there are two other heroes in this, or heroes might be an overstatement, but there are two people... Um, in particular, in your telling of the release and success of Love Me Do, who come out looking much better than they are commonly believed to be. And I'm talking about Kim Bennett at Ardmore and Beechwood, and we'll get to him in a minute, but he's the guy who helped enormously with hyping and pushing that record. And the second is Brian Epstein, who has often been slagged by Andrew Lou Goldham and Philip Norman and so many people for having bought Love Me Do into the charts. The allegation is that he bought 10,000 copies. They, they're still sitting in a warehouse somewhere in Liverpool. And you emphatically prove that is absolutely not the case. It's certainly untrue, yes. Um, it, that was, um, um, I, I, did and, has Andrew Oldham said that? Andrew Oldham seems to Oh, he's to be repeated that, yes. He's, the, he, he has uh, it. He may not have known it. He may just have read it somewhere and believed it to be true. In fact, that rumor goes all the way back to 1962, 63, right from the very start, because Love Me Do entered the music chart, the top 50 in the UK, the very weekend of its release. It came out on a Friday. Chart sales were computed, if computed was the word then, um, uh, up to Saturday's sales. So in the first 24 36 hours of its release it made the lower reaches of the chart and that put a lot of people on alert that there may have been something fishy going on there um, but in fact nothing was going on all that was happening was that brian epstein as the owner of a record store or two record stores in liverpool 
um, and because they were such big local heroes, bought in to the store for sale a lot of copies because most people who wanted it in Liverpool were going to go and buy it there. But what he never did and never tried to do was manipulate the chart. Uh, and the key um, way that I've proven that is to look at the way the charts were compiled in those days. And no charts in Britain, and there were a number of them, rivals, as it were, for the same kind of market. No chart in those days actually was based on record sale numbers. They, um, If you were compiling a chart, you would phone up the owner of a record store and ask him or her to rank their best-selling records in order. What was your best-selling record? What was your second best-selling record? What was your third? And so on, typically down to number 30. Uh, you wouldn't have to provide the sales figures for that, nor would you have to provide any proof of why you were saying that those records were your best-selling records. But there was a general assumption of honesty, and indeed there was no real reason in those days for anyone to be dishonest. So Brian Epstein was a chart return shop, NEMS, that was what the shop was called, <clears throat> and he would be phoned by people who asking him for the best sellers that week, and he would give it, but he wouldn't need to prove any sale, and he certainly wouldn't have needed to buy in a large number of copies in order to put any record at any position in a chart. He would simply give a thing over the phone. Um, this was our best selling record this week, and let's say it was a top 30 chart, the compiler of the chart would assign 30 points to that number one. Two, 29 points down for number two, 28 points for number three, and so on, all the way down to one point for number 30. And that was all that was required. So Brian did not buy the record in. And he'd already had a chance to manipulate the charts to the Beatles' advantage when Polydor released their first single with Tony Sheridan, My Bonnie. And he declined that chance. And even though it would have been very advantageous for the Beatles to have a record in the charts at that point, he didn't do it. So it, Yes, he actually was a member of a committee of the Gramophone Record Retailers Association and had come out against people who, who tried to manipulate charts. Now, Brian Epstein was an honest man. Uh, and he was he was not in anyone's interest to manipulate the charts. But as I said, even if he'd, I mean, he he could have mentioned my Bonnie as being a big hit in his store when it wasn't, and he didn't. So that's a measure of how honest he actually was. And so now that we've gotten put that away, the other thing about Brian Epstein and the in the release of Love Me Do is that his promotion of that was serious. It was expensive and it was innovative. This is a guy who had money, who had company resources, and he put them into that record. NIMS bought ads in national publications. Uh, NIMS Limited, his management company, bought, you know, the record store bought ads in magazines where it was appropriate for the record store to, to do such. But, but with the, the Beatles and Love Me Do front and center, full page ads in national magazines, and also bought Radio Time and <clears throat> printed out booklets had special promotional sleeves for the copies of Love Me Do he sold through his stores. Reading through this book, it's amazing how competent, organized, and innovative Brian Epstein's management and promotion of the Beatles was through this whole period. And to me, Love Me Do was one of his masterpieces. His Yes, you're right. And his whole management of the Beatles um, for the first year which is what i which is the, where this book covers because it goes up to the end of 62 that's his first year of management it was superb in absolutely every respect people say he was a beginner he didn't know what he was doing he was a beginner but he did know what he was doing and he was untainted by if you like um i mean it, the fact that he hadn't done this before was to his advantage because he just tried everything that he could and he was a, an original thinker like the artists he was managing the Beatles and so he really did a tremendous job in the first year of his management of the Beatles and indeed it carried on beyond that as well and anyone who says otherwise and you mentioned earlier that Brian Epstein has been slagged well he's been very unfairly slagged and he's been the recipient of a lot of jaundiced opinion based on either envy or writers wishing to slant something a particular way to their own advantage, which is something I would never try to do. I just find out what happened and report it. I'm not out to praise Brian. I'm not out to promote him. I'm merely out to look at what he did with a fair eye as opposed to an unfair eye. And um, you mentioned that Philip Norman um, 
said that Brian Epstein had bought in 10,000 copies. He wasn't the first to say that. But when he put that into shout, it absolutely seemed to establish it as a fact beyond refute. Uh, and yet he didn't have any proof for saying that. He quoted a guy called Joe Flannery in Liverpool, who whose word was not as, as solid as one might wish it to have been. And um, as I said, if it, you know, if, if any of these writers had really done the work that they could have done, then they would have seen that he didn't do it. But they didn't want to look that hard. It suited the writers to see to say that Brian had bought it in, and in some way to imply that there was something slightly crooked about him, which is a really unfair thing to do to someone who can't answer back. Absolutely. And reading your book, from the moment the Beatles sign with Brian Epstein, there is this irresistible momentum towards success it's like being on a roller coaster ratcheting up the mountain and especially with hindsight we know what is coming we know how big this thing is going to be but when you detail it day by day what brian epstein was doing for the beatles and with the beatles it's i'm a student of the music business this is one of the absolute masterpieces of music management of all time and the proofs in the pudding you can't argue with the results he got obviously he had a great product in the beatles and they did their part they worked incredibly hard and they were incredibly polished etc cetera, etc cetera. but they weren't perfect and they weren't easy to deal with and brian epstein handled it and and was an absolute visionary and the way you document the success of Love Me Do. It's what I would call a depth charge or a creeper record. This is not a record. I mean, it, it it sold big in Liverpool initially and some in Manchester and the Northwest, enough to get on the charts, but it successively improved its chart position relentlessly week after week after week. And that's a sign of A, a quality record that people are responding to, and B, an innovative an aggressive marketing campaign that Epstein financed, envisioned, and executed. So um, I think that's enough huzzahs for Brian Epstein at the moment, although you know, any that's Beatles fan should thank him for, for his role. But the second guy, and this is a guy I had never heard of before reading this book, is Kim Bennett at Ardmore and Beechwood, who, you know, the, the knock on Ardmore and Beechwood has always been, they didn't do enough to promote Love Me Do. Brian Epstein wasn't happy, so we signed with Dick James and formed Northern Songs and everything, you know, and, and history takes its course and, and legends are on there. And obviously Dick James did make major contributions. He was able to do a few things Kim Bennett wasn't able to do, but you show conclusively that Kim Bennett did excellent and relentless promo work for Love yes, Me Do. Yes, he was the, the Beatles' first champion in London. They never met him. Um, they know they, I don't know that if you've said that name to Paul McCartney or Ringo Starr today, that they would even know who he was. And yet he was instrumental in their breakthrough. The talent as ever was the Beatles. There's no, never any question of that, but talent needs help. And it, especially at the beginning when, you know, that all the doors are closed and Kim Bennett was a, an unsung hero in that he was banging on the doors all over the place, trying to get exposure for love me do not just because he thought that the beatles were worthy of it but because his job was to plug the music the copyrights that his company had signed and that included love me do and it's b-side ps i love you so his job for Ardmore and beachwood was to get exposure for love me do and he tried everything he was one of the i met him and um found out personally just what a dogged individual he was he was he was one of those guys who would like a dog with a bone we would say over here he just pick something up and he will not let it go and uh, that was his personality as i found but it, when applied to something like the promotion of a record i could see exactly why he did all the things he did because when he believed in something he absolutely went for it he even flew from london to luxembourg to get love me do played on radio luxembourg um he did everything he could to get love me do played on a radio show in the bbc radio show saturday club and in the end his efforts were undone because brian epstein innocently had encouraged the fans in Liverpool to send postcards into the show to request the record be played. Uh, and the BBC had been um, somewhat exposed and embarrassed by a, a, a 
a, a campaign a couple of years earlier with, that a music publishing company had had done to try and get ex- exposure on a record by sending in fake postcards um, requesting the record be played. And therefore, they were particularly sensitive to any number of postcards for any one record. And when Brian asked the fans in Liverpool to write in, they all did. And the guy on Saturday Club, the producer, Jimmy Grant, said, oh, all these postcards, this must be a scam. And and Kim Bennett, who had just got the record promised for the show, had it withdrawn before broadcast. And that was to his enormous frustration. But he did do everything he could. He got the record played on television. He got it on radio, on the BBC and on Luxembourg. And he just, you know, he was a champion for the Beatles when they didn't really have anybody else. The power of the Beatles as an R&B covers band. And had they chosen to go with material like Some Other Guy or Ray Charles' What I Say or the Isley Brothers' Twist and Shout, it's highly likely they would have had hits, as we see from groups like Brian Poole and the Tremolos having a big hit with Twist and Shout. Twist and Shout EP by the Beatles being a big big enough seller to get on the singles charts. Groups like the Swingin' Blue Jeans having a big hit with Hippie Hippie Shake, a very similar song that was also in the Beatles' repertoire. They could have gone down that road. That would have been a safe play, but that's not what the Beatles were about. They wanted to push their own compositions. They wanted to do a bluesy harmonica type number, something different. And that's what they did. And one last element of the promotion of Love Me Do I want to talk about is the role of Tony Calder and his network of disco DJs, which you might not think disco existed in the 60s, but it did. Jimmy Seville and others had pioneered the practice of charging people admission to come into a venue and dance and listen to records. Most often it would be played in between performance by a live orchestra, but we're beginning to see this phenomenon of independent DJs. They're not in discos, which just means a club where people play records. And so tell us about Tony Calder and his role in promoting it to this very influential group of professionals who were usually ignored by the record business at the time. Well, Brian Epstein, as as you said earlier, he was keen to do everything he could to get this record promoted. And in addition to uh, EMI having a press office and pluggers um, who weren't working that hard for Love Me Do, Um, because they weren't being encouraged to by George Martin. There was also Kim Bennett. We've covered him. But Brian paid for Tony Barrow to write a press release about the Beatles, a kind of multiple page press release. And then he went to some independent promotion men of his own, put his own money in his pocket and tried to get this record um, spread as far and wide as they could. And he went to ended up with a man called Tony Calder, young guy at that time ended up being lifelong career guy in the music industry. Uh, he formed uh, immediate records with Andrew Oldham in 1965, Tony Calder. Um, at this time, Calder was really a DJ. We use the word DJ. He span records <laughs> um, in, in a ballroom in London. And he had a little company uh, and was in league with other people who did the same, one of whom was Ian Samwell, um, who had been the writer of the great record Move It, which was Cliff Richard's first first release and first great hit uh, in 1958. And called, uh, sorry, uh, Samwell and Calder played records in ballrooms, including in Samwell's case, the Lyceum Ballroom in London. So, and people used to go dancing in their lunch hour, they, you know, office workers or whatever, could go and have a bit of lunch and dance to some records in their lunchtime. And the Lyceum is right in the middle of London. And uh, Love Me Do was played there for the dancers because Brian Epstein had actually gone to Tony Calder uh, and was prepared to spend some money on this. It wasn't, it was just buying exposure in a way, Um, but Calder and Samwell and another guy called Jeff Dexter, young guy, they all understood immediately that Love Me Do was different to anything else that was around. And because of the extraordinary breadth and depth and originality of the Beatles songwriting as the years evolved, there was always a tendency to look on Love Me Do as some kind of early primitive and not very interesting record. And I suppose if you were comparing it to uh, We Can Work It Out or Eleanor Rigby or I'm the Walrus or Hey Jude, it does come across as primitive. But on the other hand, if you consider it in its context, if you play other records that were hits 
in October 1962 and then play Love Me Do, it was wildly different to anything that was around. And people with open ears, and there's always some around the music industry, recognize that straight away. Oh, what's this? This is different. And that was the impact the Beatles had on people. And that's why Love Me Do was sustained for quite a long time as a hit, because those people who eventually got exposed to it, wherever it was, in ballrooms or whenever the Beatles are playing it or on radio, thanks to Kim Bennett or whatever, they th- they said, oh, that's different. What's that? Who's that? And that was how the Beatles broke through, by being different. And as you document in the book, when Samwell and Calder would play that record in their discos, it wasn't quite at the level of Chris Montez's Let's Dance, which was an absolute smash hit floor packer and it's still one of the great dance songs of that era but it would fill the dance floor up from zero to 80 percent full and that's the kind of thing a dj notices and his job is to get people dancing and a record that gets people dancing gets played and that's what happened with love me do and i feel like we've covered that so i want to get into some of the revelations about some of the there's basically six major characters in your telling of this book and we've talked about george martin and we've talked about brian epstein we've mentioned john lennon a little bit there's one other thing i want to mention about john lennon because after a couple maybe four decades of him being treated as a secular saint which is patently ridiculous for anybody who knows his life story to any degree he's now beginning to get backlash as you know abusive and violent and hypocritical etc cool, etc cetera, et cetera. and you've got some very telling anecdotes in there and there's one in particular when the beatles are in hamburg and john lennon who's already you know the victim of a child of a broken home he's lost his mother in his teenage years and then he loses his best friend Stu sutcliffe and you illustrate in this book what an enormous loss that was that Stu sutcliffe was closer to him than paul mccartney that Stu sutcliffe was not someone that John Lennon regarded as an artistic peer. He was someone John Lennon looked up to as an artistic superior, that he was a visionary, that he helped name the Beatles, that he set their fashion from, you know, first the sunglasses and the James Dean look, helping them perfect their rocker look to the mod look that made them famous. So this is an enormous loss, and not just as an artistic partner, but as a personal dear, dear friend. And John Lennon suffering, his behavior in Hamburg is wild to say the least and there's one story of all the beatles in their little bunk beds in their shared room and lennon comes in in the middle of the night and starts stabbing and tearing the clothes of the girl who's in bed with paul mccartney and they're literally lying there afraid for their life and you say but they still loved him that that if john lennon wasn't killing you he was the best buddy you could ever have. Talk about a little bit of that relationship and why was it that Paul McCartney and George Harrison and Brian Epstein and everybody and fans around the world love John Lennon so much despite his crazy behavior? Well, um, that is a big question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you said that um, Stuart was closer to John than Paul was. I, I don't know that I would entirely... At, at times, I mean... Well, yeah. I mean... In life, we all have a lot of friendships, and it's not easy. And it's only only one person, and that will be John Lennon, could actually say who was the more important to him. They were both crucial to him, both Paul and Stuart, in different ways. Um, Stuart was older than John, and he was so he was uh, a little bit older. He was his contemporary at art school, uh, and they were friends in a different way. With with Paul, John had a tremendous friendship and a tremendous bond, and though they wouldn't have used these words in those days they loved each other um but it was a different thing with Stuart and um because Stuart wasn't didn't have Paul McCartney's musical talent but he had something else instead and he and they were both important to John and it will be hard to rank one above another but John had suffered a lot of loss in his life he'd been passed around between his parents and his auntie uh when he was an infant um Eventually, just to quickly nutshell this, he formed a good relationship with his mother, albeit that she was more like a kind of older sister to him. Uh, And then she was run down and killed. Uh, His uncle George died uh, prematurely. And and then John had this great friendship. When you're very young, you don't think that death is around you among your contemporaries. And Stuart died at 21 years old. And John felt that, I think Paul McCartney said this, that he was kind of, that John felt he was a curse on people, that all the people he loved around him died. 
And Stuart's death was particularly um, vicious to John in that respect because it was a, a great blow to lose any friend, uh, but especially at the age of 21. Uh, but John was in Hamburg when it happened, and that was the, the safest place for him to, to be because, um, I mean, no one talked in those days about post-traumatic stress disorder, but that's undoubtedly what John was suffering if we were put a label on it today. Uh, and in Hamburg, he could behave in an extreme way and get away with it. Uh, including being completely drunk and wired on speed and um, picking up a pair of scissors and stabbing things in the room and um, uh, and cutting up clothes. And I think it's George Harrison who told that story of they're all in their bunks going, shit, I hope he doesn't stab me. <laughs> But they loved George. They loved him. Why did they love John Lennon? They loved John Lennon because John Lennon was also, in addition to all the other things about him that we know, he was lovable. Uh, And he was loved by people um, consistently through his life, not by everybody. Uh, And there were many people who were very much steer clear of him because they sensed that he was trouble. He was edgy, but he was loved by many people genuinely, including most certainly Paul and George and Ringo and Brian and George Martin uh, and lots of fans and lots of people who came into contact with him because he was honest and he was true uh, and he was a great friend to people. In the Depending on how you define friendship, if one of your definitions is that he will do everything for you, he will give you the clothes off his back if you don't have any yourself, he was one of those guys. I mean, I was no, I never met him. But I've spoken to enough people who have had that kind of a friendship with John Lennon to know what kind of a person he was for them. That doesn't mean he still wasn't edgy with them and sometimes gave them the rough edge of his tongue because he did and he could and he would. But he was also a genuine guy. And this is also true for the others. I'm not just saying you asked me about John, so I'm talking about John. But I'm not saying this to promote John above the others. But you asked me about him and that's the answer. And 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 there's so much more we could talk about, John, but I want to get to George. And and obviously, Paul is wonderful, and you say many very interesting things about Paul, particularly his resistance to Brian Epstein. But I don't think we have time to get into that, because I want to get into George Harrison's role as essentially the personnel director of the Beatles from day one of joining the band as a 15-year-old who's six inches shorter than John Lennon and Paul McCartney from the pictures in the book. This little twerp comes in the band and immediately clears the decks and pushes, the, you know, pushes for the firing of Eric Griffiths and and um, other Deadwood in the band. And then he's the one ultimately who brings in Ringo Starr. And later he would bring in Billy Preston. Mm-hmm. He hires Mal Evans. And so this notion that George Harrison is some sort of Deadwood is so wrong. And the book really establishes that this guy not only sang great harmonies and played good guitar and was an incredibly dogged hard worker at that, but that he was absolutely critical to the chemistry of the Beatles and the, and had an enormous role in their success. All four Beatles were essential to the chemistry. You absolutely. Remove any, remove any one of them, uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and it wouldn't have been the same. None of them was Deadwood. I don't know why anyone would think otherwise. Um, but George, in 1995, I was working on the Beatles anthology TV series uh, for Apple Corps, and there was a production office in West London that was set up just to put together the TV series. And it had about... Um, 20 people in it uh, and they were all necessary very hard working staff everybody pulling together on the team to make a great tv series um but george came in one day and said what are all these people doing here who are all these people why am i paying for all these people what i mean is, is it overstaffed and that's exactly what he said when he joined the quarrymen in 1958 who are all these guys what do we need all these people for and there was he recognized that it should be John, because he led it, uh, and Paul, because Paul brought him in and was obviously indispensable, uh, and him. And the others weren't necessary. They weren't required. And that was George's personality. He, He saw things clearly. He was always he always spoke his mind uh, and he had there was an economy about him in the way that he did things. It's like, well, we don't need more people here than than there should be. And um, so, yeah, he he though John had brought in this guy at the beginning called Eric Griffiths. John just George just said, well, we don't need him. Let's get rid of him. Uh, And soon enough, they were down to a, a crucible three called themselves J-Pace 3 for a while as a trio. Um, 
And then he got Ringo in. Oh, well, Pete, of course, was there. And Pete is important, very important. But he was the one, George was the one who got Ringo in. And George always had a strong personality. Um, I say in the book that if, if in life, if you were a pushover, John Lennon would push you over. But he was also accepting of people who stood up to him. And when George joined John and Paul, George was, what, two and a half years younger than John, which in teenage terms is a vast chasm. And yet John accepted him in the group because George put, put um, stuck up for himself. He wasn't he wouldn't be pushed over. And George always had a wisdom and a kind of um, a, a, an age, uh, a, a kind of a, a maturity that belied his actual age. And it was also the fashion play to the Beatles, but I want to turn to Ringo now because you hammer home and anybody with ears and anybody who's played in bands should be able to appreciate Ringo. Although I've known many drummers who don't for whatever reason, but the guy kept perfect time and he played his parts to further the song and is a brilliant drummer, but you really hammer that home that from day one of Ringo joining a skiffle group. And this is just as a scuff, who has a kit but can't even practice at home. But from day one, he's in the most successful skiffle groups in Liverpool. Then he's in the most successful rock groups in Liverpool. And so when the Beatles picked him to be in the band, this wasn't a case of some yokel falling off the cabbage truck into a pile of millions of pounds. This is Liverpool's best drummer, a star personality, and again, a very strong character. Yes, he'd been in drummer in the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group. They were pretty good uh, as Skiffle Groups went in those days. Uh, then he was with uh, the only Liverpool Skiffle Group to get on television, the Dark Town Skiffle Group. He wasn't with them when they were on TV, unfortunately, but they had been on BBC. Um, then before the Beatles break through, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were reckoned to be the, the biggest and best in Liverpool. He was their drummer. And then when the Beatles eclipsed Rory, which they did quite early, um, Ringo wanted to be with them. And eventually the stars did align. Um, when you're a musician and the guy behind you on the skins is is not right, not the right fit for whatever reason, you know it if you're on the front line. Uh, and typically, similarly, when the guy behind you is the right fit, then you know that too. And when they drummed with Ringo when Pete was ill or couldn't play for whatever reason, they always felt better. And they knew that they had to get rid of Pete uh, and that they wanted Ringo in his place. And Ringo was the chosen one in that respect. They said to Ringo, we want you. And it was a brilliant thinking on their part. Brian Epstein at the time couldn't see the wisdom of the decision, but he came to see it. And that also goes back to where we were at the beginning, Brian and the Beatles. Brian knew from the start that he couldn't impose anything on these guys, that they had to make the key decisions themselves, but he would enable whatever their wishes were. Um, so we've talked about John and George and Ringo, but, you know, we really can't not talk about Paul. I don't want to overlook Paul. Let's talk about Sir Paul. Um, as always, there's something, you know, that there's. it's no accident that Paul was the one who ended up isolated from the other three. He always had sort of, I don't know, a distance from the others in some ways, but they're all very close to each other. They're all perfect. This most successful pop phenomenon of all time could only have worked with each of the four members. Paul, in some ways, the most gifted musician. But you show in the book, there's a reason he was he gravitated to John Lennon. This is a guy who repeatedly, under stress, when put in the spotlight, struggled. And he's also a guy who bridled at being told what to do and resisted the signing, the uh, the Beatles signing Brian Epstein as a manager. Talk a little bit about the Enigma of Paul, and what would you like our readers to, our listeners to come away with? Because oh, um, you've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm not so sure. I, I don't know that I agree with you. In fact, I know I know that I don't agree with you about the distance between them. I think as the years went by. Um, for geographical and other reasons, then a slight rift did occur, three of them living out together in Surrey in southwest of London and Paul living in London. That, that kind of introduced a bit of a schism between them purely on geographical terms. But in terms of being a bandmate, Paul was absolutely in with all the others and they were in with him. They had they, they complemented each other beautifully. And um, Paul was crucial to the Beatles. It couldn't have happened without him because his talent, I mean, 
arguably what uh, the words you just used about probably the best musician in the Beatles. You didn't quite say that, but there was something you said. He was far and away the best musician in the Beatles. He's far and away the best musician that I've ever known. I mean, he is a genius, a musical genius. He really is. It's not a word one should bandy about lightly, but he was and still is. And uh, his 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 sense of melody, his his ability to write extraordinary songs, his 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 harmony singing, his his guitar playing. He plays almost every instrument. Now he was the musical backbone of the Beatles in in that sense, in that he was original and and uh, innovative at all times. Um, his personality was a good fit too. The Lennon and McCartney were a perfect fit together. Paul looked up to John enormously, but John recognised that Paul had a lot of musical talent that he didn't have, and they leaned on one another and brought each other, brought their skills to the table, and they fitted together like a glove, a hand in a glove, and it was just a brilliant thing that these two guys, Lennon and McCartney, came together. Um, they all had complicated personalities, not just Paul, uh, but the one you, you brought up, the fact that Paul didn't want Brian Epstein as the manager, he probably did want Brian Epstein as the manager, manager but paul has a way of testing people it's just a personality thing we all have something in our personalities and one of his things is to test people uh, especially if they're going to be doing something for him in some way providing a service the beatles were desperate to break through to the next layer the next level on the ladder uh, and brian epstein was the only man around who seemed likely to be able to provide it you would think, therefore, that Paul, as highly ambitious as he was, which they all were, um, would have welcomed Brian with open arms. But in fact, he set down some some tests for Brian uh, and became a bit of a thorn in Brian's side for quite a while. They never had the relationship, say, that George and Brian had or John and Brian or indeed Ringo and Brian. But that is just a thing. That's just one of the things. But Paul's um, contribution to the Beatles is enormous and um and, and I mean, i'm not trying to minimize them it's i know absolutely not, but in a sense in a sense their success really owes more to paul than to john because in terms of um music that was played on the radio say it was easier for radio to play paul mccartney songs than john lennon songs and similarly for fans to get into paul mccartney songs and john lennon songs. not that john was without his fans but Paul's stuff was always that bit more accessible and therefore made, you know, a huge contribution to their breakthrough. Yeah. And, and, and we can bandy back on that. Cause another thing from reading this book that, that I was reminded of, that's such an obvious thing that I've known since childhood, but you really hammer home through quotes from people who saw him at the time that John Lennon was an incredible gifted singer from day one, that this guy was somebody who could entertain a whole bus full of people on a trip to Scotland before the quarrymen had even formed, that, you know, when school friends who'd known him since childhood heard him at his first skiffle audition, they were blown away by John Lennon's obvious palpable gift as a rock and roll singer. And so I don't want to forget that. I mean, it's easy to praise Paul McCartney because he is a world genius, you know, a Beethoven or Mozart level talent. But John Lennon is somebody who wasn't gifted with that degree of talent, but he was still incredibly gifted. And he went toe to toe with Paul McCartney until 1970. And many people scored a tie, which is an incredible, incredible accomplishment. Yeah. What, what we're talking about here is four unusual people. None of these guys was an ordinary guy. They were all different. They were all individuals who brought, who were able to fit into a collective whole. Um, but they, they were all standout young guys. Is that, you know, if you if you walk into if you walk on a street and you see 50 young lads, teenage boys walking down the street, there might be one who has something about him that is different, something that makes you go, oh, that guy's interesting. And that's what John Lennon had. And that's what Paul had. And that's what George had. And that's what Ringo had. They each had that. And then they came together. And then they found that the their strong individuality actually fitted beautifully. Yes. And and so one last question. I have to ask this. How is volume two coming along? <laughs> it's coming along very well. It's a huge job. Um, it's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm breaking off to speak to you. But I, when we finish this call, I'll be straight back on it. I'm not going to put a date on when it's coming out. There's a thing on my website, if anyone wants to look at that, in which I explain why I can't put a date on it. But it is coming. It is coming together very well.